You're listening to the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, a show all about inspiring you, the pharmacy professional, on your path towards achieving financial freedom. Hi, I'm Tim Baker, and today I chat with YFP Planning's lead planners, Kelly Reddy Hefner and Robert Lopez to walk through our fourth case study of a fictitious family, the Patels. Amin Patel is 59 and is an independent pharmacy owner who is looking to sell his pharmacy to his daughter, Jesse, who currently works on staff at the pharmacy. We discuss the Patel's retirement timeline and how they'll need to coordinate with an attorney and CPA to best structure the succession plan to Jesse. Amin's wife, Hannah, is 55 and works as a teacher. At retirement, she'll receive a pension and has questions of how to claim it, along with how to claim Social Security. We also discuss questions about what they should do with their rental property and what, how they should handle the proceeds, whether they should pay down debt or invest. Finally, we discuss their investments and insurance policies as they approach this very important transition. What's up, everyone? Welcome to our fourth case study in our series. Um, glad to be back with you. We're going to today go through the Patels. Patels are going to be a little bit of a different case. So in the past, we've we've talked through you know, uh, a couple in their 30s, a couple in their 40s, a couple in their 60s. Now we're actually going to talk about Amin Patel and Hannah Patel, who are a couple in their 50s. We're actually a, a pharmacy owner. So I'm glad to uh, welcome back Kelly and Robert to go through this case study. Guys, what's going on? Doing Just well. Stay- Staying cool out here in, in Phoenix. <laughs> awesome. So let's let's jump into it, guys. So like I said, we're going to be talking about the Patels and what they're looking at as they approach retirement. So Robert, why don't you set us up like we've done in previous cases and kind of go through their, their overall demographic, what they're looking at, where they live. Kelly, you're going to get into goals and debt, and then I'll kind of take us home with the rest of the, you know, the balance sheet. Yeah. So let's jump right in. So we have... Aman and Hannah Patel. So Aman is a pharmacy owner. He's 59 years old. The salary he's pulling out of the business is $150,000 a year. And obviously as a pharmacy owner, he has no other income. That's kind of his main source. His wife is a teacher. She's 55. She makes $75,000 a year. And then she has some tutoring and uh, support on the side where she makes an additional $10,000 a year. They file their taxes jointly. And they are joining the pharmacy by their daughter, Jessie, who is a 29-year-old single pharmacist who works through the pharmacy as well. They are residents of St. Paul, Minnesota. Their income numbers break down to a gross of $235,000, which breaks down to $19,500 monthly and roughly $9,500 net, meaning after taxes, contributions, and insurance. So those expenses break down to roughly like a 40 20 40 fixed expenses, variable expenses, and savings. They're living in a three-bedroom single-family home that they purchased back in 2005 when the prices were good. It was a 30-year mortgage at 5.5-75%. They were able to refinance in 2012 down to 3.5%, and they have about $155,000 left on that mortgage. All right. In terms of goals, uh, they both want to retire in the next several years. Amin would like to sell the pharmacy to daughter Jessie and help her with that transition. Hannah will receive a teacher's pension. So that is about $2,500 per month, but she doesn't quite know how to claim that, how it works. And then also knowing what their social security benefit might be as well is important. They are interested in no longer having their rental income property and would like to sell that along with the pharmacy, but they are interested in staying in the St. Paul area. They have questions about paying off their debt as they're looking for that financial independence and retirement. Amen wants to golf more regularly and take those trips abroad, and Hannah wants to be more involved with charitable endeavors. They both want to help Jesse as much as possible, um, both as a new pharmacy owner and she has some student loan debt as well. So the debt in question that we'll be looking at is that there is still the home equity line of credit that looks like a balance of about $10,000. they are paying aggressively on that, and it does have the interest rate of the 5%, as Robert mentioned. There is a car note of about $15,000 that has an interest rate of 4%. They're paying $250 per month on that. And then they do have that mortgage payment for their primary residence, um, just under $1,400 for that and about 10 years remaining. From a wealth building perspective, and again, kind of bouncing back and forth between the net worth statement, they have about $50,000 in cash in the checking account and then another $75,000 in a high yield savings account. 
they have a variety of investment accounts, uh, Roth IRAs for both of them, 403B for, for Hannah, the SEP IRA that Amon has through the pharmacy, and then a taxable account um, that they've been contributed to. So for the, for the 403B, Hannah has that in addition to her pension. She puts about 10% in, which is about $15,000. She's invested in, in balance funds. Amon's SEP IRA that he puts money into, he, he tries to target about $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. He's more conservative with his allocation. The Roth IRAs um, they've had in recent years contributed to, but they've stopped because they're over the, the threshold for married found jointly. Right now, they're directing all of those funds to their joint taxable account. So it's about $1,400 a month or, or nearly $70,000 a year. And again, in terms of the the uh, allocation for the Roth IRAs, balance more for Hannah, conservative more for Amin. And basically, the taxable account is going to be used to supplement the, re the retirement. On the real estate perspective, they do have their primary home that they've purchased, and it's worth about nine three hundred ninety five thousand, with about one hundred fifty five thousand left on the mortgage. They have a rental property, which was their first home that they didn't sell once they purchased the most recent one. That's worth about two hundred seventy five thousand with no mortgage. And then Amin had did a recent ev evaluation on the pharmacy. And he thinks that, that the pharmacy is worth about 750000 So that's basically the, the balance sheet. From, from a wealth protection perspective, Amon has a $1.5 million term policy, life insurance policy that will expire age 70. Hana has one quarter of a million dollars that will expire age 66. Amon has no short-term or long-term disability. Uh, Hannah has what she has through an employer, which basically covers 60% short-term, 60% long-term. Professional liability, Amon has his own policy. And then their estate documents definitely need to be dusted off, need to be updated and reviewed, especially with kind of the sale of the business uh, upcoming. So they're going to have to engage in, you know, attorneys for the sale and, and, and estate attorney to kind of get that rolling. From a tax perspective, Amon has an account he's used for the last 10 years. And then they're just concerned about how the taxes are going to be treated, you know, related to selling the business. So they have to kind of navigate that. So miscellaneous things, Hannah makes additional income, as Kelly said. With school activities, and she might continue to do that post retirement. Cash flow and staffing issues are top are, are top issues during the transition. So you know, I'm just making sure that you know the farmers can run and have you know the adequate staffing to make sure that Jesse is not you know killing herself. You know, initially, you know, they have questions about do they what when do they you know what's the timing of selling the rental property? What do they do with the proceeds? Do they invest that? Do they you know they're kind of leaning towards more paying off the debt. And then Jesse wants to expand services at the pharmacy to increase lines of revenue, but Amon is less sure. So you kind of have that change management that they're going to have to negotiate in terms of like who is the boss and when and what that looks like. So a lot of stuff going here, guys. Kelly, I'll start with you. What would be some of the things that jump off the page for you in terms of you know what we need to tackle you know with with regard to the financial plan? I mean, I guess the top priority would be the sale of the pharmacy since it relates to funds they'd have available for retirement, also helping to take care of Jesse in the process as well. This certainly would speak to needing an attorney to be involved and yeah. some tax planning as well. But I guess one of the things to think through would be like, you know, how much you know, Jesse has student loans, her resources might not be robust to do an outright sale if the value of the pharmacy is, you know, $750,000. So sometimes those family sales can be structured over time, deciding if there's an interest rate or as part of it, a gift um, would all be things that would be important to think about. And maybe the smaller increments would be helpful for the family in terms of planning as well, just to keep that tax liability for um, and, and Hannah a little bit more manageable from year to year. So I guess that's where I would start is getting some professional input to see what their options are, what an interest rate you know, might look like, and how Jesse might be able to you know, facilitate payment. That might also touch on the question of who's making decisions. If a partial buyout if you know i think those are always important things like the non dollar and cents is just some of those logistics about how decisions will be made who is going to be the board of directors how to transition out and still you know if you still have kind of a foot in the door what does that mean in terms of your input and say 
Yeah, this is definitely one of those instances where, you know, as the CFP, I think you're you're trying to quarterback and bring in different professionals because obviously from a legal perspective, from a tax perspective, you know, uh, an attorney, a CPA are going to have insight in, in terms of how to best structure this and then, you know, kind of herd the cats along with, you know, with a financial plan to see, okay, how does this all fit together? But yeah, timing of like the sale, is it a complete sale? Is it something that invests over time? How does the, you know, tax work in terms of, you know, capital gains on the sale of that? How do you structure a promissory note? Is there money down? Is is Jesse taking less of a salary and doing more sweat equity? Or is she kind of being paid, you know, as an independent pharmacist would, you know, at a market rate? So those are all things I think that like those would be questions that, you know, bringing in other professionals to help kind of navigate that. And I think, Robert, I don't know your take, but I think like, you know, three to five years, I think the time is now you know, to, to start those conversations because I think it's going to, it just takes, especially with an asset, like it's going to take longer than than they think. So, you know, outside of kind of bringing in some of the professionals to start asking and answering some of these questions, what else would you want to know more about whether it's goals or what that looks like with regard to the their their plan and and, the, and kind of this transition that's coming up yeah how much does he really want to work after that right so he's 59 right now you know yeah is, he, is he, are we saying we're going to stop working at 62 or 60 65 is this a i want to have this transition started in 3 to 5 years if he's going to continue to work especially helping her out right if she's taking on the, the purchase of the business, she's going to have to decrease expenses and she may do that, decrease that sweat equity, right? But she's going to need help from a staffing perspective. So if he's yep. going to be working there into the future, then yeah, the time is now to get that transition started. So that way she can slowly take over while he's still accruing an income and then working on transitioning that business. I, th- I think a real perspective on not only when they want to sell the pharmacy, but when he wants to fully retire, will set that timeline from a payout perspective as totally. well. So they are working with the the lawyers and the uh, the accountants to decide what the timetable or the time horizon is for that buyout. That'll factor in pretty strongly. Yeah, and I think like you know, it, it could be one of those things where if you're doing some part time staffing at a pharmacy that your your, your daughter's running that you kind of built that. That might be a little bit more enjoyable in the later years of your career where you're not having to worry about payroll or you're not having to worry about management and, and things like that. Obviously, you're mentoring your your daughter, but maybe it just kind of takes a lot of the, the stress off of you and it c- can extend your career. The thing that I would have bouncing around in my head is, okay, how can we structure this? You know, if it's a if it's a seller finance and note that, you know, we can get paid enough. To kind of get to that age seventy, where social security, social security, you know, the strategy might be to delay that, you know, take take money from the retirement accounts, delay social security, and then use that that structured note as a way to kind of bridge that, you know, that period. So, I think those are the discussions in terms of like, you know, how long is that note going to be? What's the interest rate? To Kelly, your point, if it's if it's not a market interest rate, that that has to be considered a gift um, that we have to kind of track and make sure that we're we're accounted for. So. You know, th- these are all things. I think it-, it goes back to the goals, right? So, like, when when do you see yourself getting out? And you know, is it something where it's a clean break? You know, there's a note in here about Jesse kind of wants to she wants to expand services. You know, is Amon going to be on board with that if he's still majority owner? If it's like a 50 50 thing, or is it at this date? You know, in January one you know, 2028 or whatever it is that they're going to, you know, basically hand the keys to, to Jesse, and then it's going to be hers to run. Those are all things I think to get on the table and and flesh out to make sure it, it, you know, it works for everyone. Kelly, what's your, what's your take in terms of like, you know, it sounds like they kind of want to simplify life, you know, obviously passing on the ownership of the pharmacy to Jesse, they, you know, talked about, you know, selling the rental property, you know, kind of getting out of the landlord game. What's your take in terms of, you know, timing of that, what to do with the proceeds, et cetera? I guess the timing of the sale of the rental property is pretty well timed to have this conversation with the way the housing market (laughs) is at, at present. So I guess that's always a factor, like depending on the urgency, like understanding the market factors and like, is it now? Is it maybe wait a bit? You know, we have at present such an interesting 
situation. We're coming off like really high rates for purchases, low interest rates um, earlier in the summer now with the rates rising. So I guess that would be a component is you know, kind of getting some professional advice about the market and whether now is the time. In terms of what to do with it, like I think it would be interesting to build out, you know, I've I've heard you in the podcast, Tim, talk about the retirement paycheck. So kind of what do they need to have? That pension for Hannah adds a really nice resource, understanding at what year she gets what amount and if there are any other benefits from that pension would be good to know, like, are there any healthcare benefits, any yeah. disability survivor benefits? So details there, but then kind of looking at what's coming in from the pension, getting their social security statements pulled, then yep. you can t- take a look at expenses and see like, okay, well, you know, then I feel like then you're looking at the debts and seeing like, well, what really does need to be paid off to make that paycheck work with the resources you know, the rate of the 5% is on the high side. So I like that they're aggressively paying that off. That probably would be the top thing I would target. The car and the mortgage, a little bit less so, but again, depending on resource, if they really don't want to have any payments, that does come back to personal preference. We can run some numbers. It's probably a combination of the two. Like, you know, does the paycheck work? Do the financial numbers work? and just how they feel about having some debt going into retirement. Yeah, and what's not represented here is probably like what is the rental income that, you know, they're getting from that. So obviously, you know, giving that up for the potential of, you know, liquidating, you know, the 275,000 which is what we think it's worth. And then, you know, again, how to apply that to to the debt. I'm not, I'm to your point, I'm less concerned about that. I think maybe getting getting rid of the HELOC maybe the car note and then keeping the mortgage, you know, rolling could be could be kind of a a balance, but you know, right now where the market is is like if you have cash to potentially put in the market, now is the best time to do it because of how depressed prices are. Again, not not a advocate of time in the market, but it could be that, you know, we line up this the sale, you know, along with, you know, to Robert's point, when we exit, the, you know, the pharmacy and kind of do it in all one swell uh, fail swoop. Or just kind of let the market drive it in terms of, you know, maybe you list it for sale and or you try to rent it simultaneously and see what comes out. So I think there's there's a little bit of give there. We don't there's not an overwhelming need for cash, I think, as we as we sit here, but definitely something to kind of again flesh out with regard to um, you know, with regard to the 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 plan. Robert, from an insurance perspective, is there anything that kind of jumps out here? Obviously, Kelly mentioned the pension. One of the things I did look up in Minnesota. If you're in the if you're a state employee, you also you do get Social Security as well. So she'll have that. You know, a lot of state employees don't pay into Social Security, so they don't have that benefit. So that'll she'll kind of be able to get both. But in terms of like looking at the pension, looking at healthcare, Medicare, you know, they she has some life disability. Do you have any any big concerns from a insurance perspective as you're kind of approaching this plan? It's it's hard to say kind of what that that overall perspective looks like. I think their life insurance policies are in a good place right now. Uh, I mean, it's going to go out till seventy. She's going to go out till sixty six. You know, she's mm-hmm. got the short term, long term disability and the social security disability benefits from them. He doesn't have any disability benefits, but as a pharmacy owner with the daughter working there, you could probably finagle some 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 work that you could still accomplish for an income. The professional liabilities there. It I would I'd be interested in starting to look at maybe some long term care depending on what the parents yeah. look like, right? What does mom and dad look like from them? Um, are they still around? Is this something that they're going to have to care for? Um, and then what that longevity looks like for Hannah. And I mean, um, are they going to be expecting to, to do some long-term care? Because we're, as we approach that age 60, it starts to become more of a conversation of, is this a policy we need to be looking into? But yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I think the other thing, you know, so if we look at you kind of mentioned, you know, not having anything through the pharmacy. I think one of the things that, you know, is glaring is is the kind of a lack of a 401k offering, which a lot of small businesses, independent pharmacies, you know, don't offer. And I think it's because of like the expense related to to 401ks. I think there are options out there. So that would be something that I would be talking to the two about them, you know, once the dust settles or some of these initial things is to kind of open up that bucket. So they can defer, you know, uh, Jesse could defer for herself, even um, if Amin is planning to do that, is to kind of set up that bucket. So, you know, it's another place to to basically, um, you know, get retirement funds set aside 
Um, so I would definitely encourage encourage that. In terms of the investments, obviously, they're pretty conservative to balance between the two of them, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing to be three to five years from retirement. They're prob- that's probably fine. But when we get post-retirement and kind of out, outside of that eye of the storm with you know, sequence risk, we're gonna have to adjust that, you know, once we get the kind of everything rolling. But yeah, I think I think the big thing here is is really to start the conversations if they haven't already and you know, with the CPA, with the attorney, just to make sure everything is tracking to, you know, what they're trying to do. I think the big thing that I would be talking to the two of them about is, you know, you got make sure you're taking, you know, anytime you have kids, it's making sure you're taking care of yourself and your retirement and not, you know, being I don't want to say overly generous with with the deal, but you want to make sure that you know it's structured in a way that benefits both. You know, I know you're concerned about just these loans as well, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to make sure that the retirement nest egg has longevity, and you know that I'm in Hannah don't have to go back into the workforce to kind of sustain you know their livelihood. So, a lot going on here. Anything else that you guys would would call out with regard to the the plan? I think the taxable investment that they're doing, I think there might be a better use for that. Basically, yeah. it seems like they took some of that mortgage money that they weren't paying before minus the property taxes, and they started putting it into a taxable account, which is a, a strong idea. Let's have that money grow for us in the future. But I think if we're putting that in $1,400 a month, that money, we could max out her 403B. So let's get that 403B yeah. maxed out. That brings down the adjusted gross income, which might even get us below or close to a threshold where we could start making some sort of Roth contributions yep. again. They're over 50, so they get a little bit of plus up. So yep. it gives them a little bit of gap there. So if we can get under that threshold, that would be a nice place to just get more money going towards the retirement instead of in a taxable account. That's a great point. And the so so the catch up for the Roth IRAs, they could put up to seven thousand, so six thousand plus a thousand dollar catch up. And then for the four oh three B, I think they have a, a special provision where you know it's twenty thousand five hundred, and I think it's an extra sixty five hundred for a catch up. And four oh three Bs have kind of some special rules with regard to the catch up. That's that would be another a place to put dollars. You know, I I, I definitely want to see a balance of Roth, taxable, and pre-tax, which I think they have a have a good. But to your point, they probably could plus up more into in the Hannah's potentially open up the Roth IRA, and I think they have a sizable enough taxable portion that mm-hmm. if they needed to draw from that in addition to IRAs um, as they're waiting to claim Social Security, there's probably enough there to do that. Again, we'd have to model that out and see, but you know, potentially take advantage of the four or three B while while it's there. So that's a great point, Robert. Anything else that you guys would? Uh, all out here. I think uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I mean, I would agree with the investment assessment. I mean, even exploring backdoor Roths if they're over the limit. Yeah. At, at some point, you'll model Roth conversions potentially as well with other resources when the time is right. I guess the other thing with insurance too, if he does sell it, if Amin sells the pharmacy to his daughter, you know, and there's a buy sell agreement, like often that involves insurance as well, if they're partners and kind of just keeping an eye on that. Liability, cross purchase, key person, all of those things, you know, probably just need to be, you know, re-looked at and potentially even bringing in a, you know, insurance professional to make sure that that's all, all looking good. Yeah. So I think those are, those are good points as well. So, well, guys, really appreciate the thoughts on this. You know, I think a lot of work to do. I think a lot of coordination, Obviously, with the sale of an asset, transition into retirement, working with family, there's, I think, um, good constructive conversation to be had. So I appreciate your guys' uh, you know, thoughts on on this case study day, and I'm looking forward to, to doing the next one. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com 
forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.